Hey everyone, welcome to the Hills Like White Elephants Analysis Lecture. If you have not watched, uh, I'm sorry, if you've not read the short story yet, then please pause this, read the story, it's very quick, and then come back to watch this, okay? Because I'm gonna go, I'm going over this with the idea that you have already read it, okay? Um, you will miss some stuff if you just watch this without reading the story itself. Okay. All right. So you need to, you know, get primed by reading the story first. Okay. All right. This is by Ernest Hemingway. <clears throat> uh, this is set at a train station in Spain. It's a brief snapshot of a man and a young woman named Jig who are traveling through Spain in the late 1920s. The story is told from the objective point of view which means that nearly all the dialogue with very little narrative intrusion. The setting is the Ebro River and the hills behind it. Is that a train station? Already that should symbolize the train station. A choice has to be made. This is, it. This is a story about a choice. Um, the couple, they're traveling about, enjoying freedom and perhaps indulging in a bit of the bohemian lifestyle. <laughs> they're not married. But their suitcases contain a lot of tags from hotel rooms. Oh, naughty, naughty, naughty. Okay. What? There is conflict in paradise. Okay. Uh, we have this, this, I'm going to provide a, a couple of chunks of quotes throughout the, uh, the, this lecture. And I also want you to think about this, okay? Imagine that, like, essentially this, uh, analysis is is like an analytical essay. I'm going to be going about this like you would in writing an analysis essay. Uh, there will be claims being made, there will be proof from the text, and then there will be some outside sources. Okay. So this chunk of text here we have, the girl was looking off at the line of hills. They were white in the sun and the country was brown and they looked like white elephants, she said. Ugh, I've never seen one. The man drank his beer. No, you wouldn't have. A little bit of a dig. Okay, that's mm -hmm. that's that's a little bit of a spite. Okay, resentment. Uh, he says I might have just because you say I wouldn't have to prove anything, and that's him being defensive. He's being a little defensive. Okay, to her stab, her dig. It seems there is trouble in paradise. Jig seems discontented with their adult existence. He says, It tastes like licorice, the girl said, and put the glass down. That's the way with everything. Yes, said the girl, everything tastes of licorice. Especially all the things you waited so long for, like absinthe. Oh, cut it out. You started it, the girl said. I was being amused. I was having a fine time. Well, let's try and have a fine time. All right, I was trying. I said the mountains looked like white elephants. Wasn't that bright? That was bright. I wanted to try this new drink, because that's all we do, isn't it? We'll look at things and try new drinks. <laughs> so yeah, there's some tension in this conversation going on. There's some. There's the, she is uh, upset about what they do. She's not enjoying the drink. He's clearly not interested in trying to dive into what her feelings are and why she feels this way. He is essentially doing the bare minimum of, of um, exploring this. He is not one to be bothered by it. Okay. Uh, neither one of them is necessarily like in the right thus far as much as we know. She, you know, some could say like, so usually when I have students read this and we're in a class, some some students say she's being bratty, okay? But then like he's also being like uninvolved and clearly uh, she there's something that's bothering her, but he's not trying to find out like what it is, okay? So he's not really caring about her feelings. And uh, so, you know, but she's also not being direct with what she's feeling. And so absent. Uh, she mentioned that. This is an alcoholic drink Jig refers to in the story. And it was reputed to have psychoactive effects. It was also reputed to be poisonous if overindulged in. It caused hallucinations. 
Okay, we'll get back to you. Okay, so there is literal conflict between the two young lovers in this story. And I use young, he's not really that young, okay? Uh, they're young in terms of their relationship is young, okay? And I'll get to later in a little bit about how she's young, but he's not really all that young. But there actually is a literal conflict. But then also, underneath that literal conflict is a bigger symbolic conflict that we'll get to. But first, let's just try to dive down and get to the literal, actual conflict of the story. He says, it's really an awfully simple operation, Jig, the man said. It's not really an operation at all. The girl looked at the ground, the, the, uh, the table legs rested on. I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's really not anything. It's just to, uh, put the air in. The girl did not say anything. I'll go with you, and I'll stay with you all the time. They just let the air in, and then it's all perfectly natural. Well, if you read the story, and you did not talk to anybody, and you did not read anything about it, then you might not know what he's referring to. Uh, or you, you might have read the story, not spoken to anybody, not write any type of analysis about it, but picked up on it, about what he's talking about, okay? Or you read uh, this on Spark Notes, got a summary of it, and then read what, what this is talking about. And that is an abortion. He is talking her uh, about having an abortion. Jig is currently knocked up, okay? And they're at a train station, and they gotta make a decision. Do they go? get an abortion or do they not okay that's the literal conflict of the story but the story is layered in symbolism okay layered in symbol in symbolism in the ways in which we can have alternative interpretations of this story first off the girl which we learned to find out is jig her name is jig uh the american has no name okay Jig, quote the great Britney Spears, Jig is not a girl, yet not a woman, which makes her like one day into being legal. Of course, she's a woman because she can reproduce. I mean, she's, she's pregnant, you know, but you know, I mean, 13 year olds, uh, we don't consider 13 year olds women. And I'm not saying Jig is 13, but just because one can reproduce doesn't mean that they are an adult. Okay. And she's drinking alcohol. So she's legal enough to drink alcohol, but I mean, 1920s Europe, uh, I don't think that that, uh, that is overly uh, as old as 21, okay? So Jig is like right over the line of being whatever you would consider to be legal. So maybe like 16, um, hopefully older than Juliet, older, older than 13, okay? But she's definitely not what we would, her frontal lobe and her brain is not fully developed yet. She is not a real actual, what we consider to be a woman yet, okay? She is, uh, and you know what's interesting is that the term adolescence and teenager, these did not come into um, our vernacular until the 19-teens. This story is written in the 20s, which is, is not that far removed. So like, they didn't really even, they weren't even really necessarily using the verbiage of teenager or adolescent. Uh, but I think that if this story was written today with the same idea of Jig, Hemingway would have would have used the term teenager. Okay, Jig is a. It's kind of like I think in like Italy, teenagers can drink alcohol at the age of sixteen. Okay, that's somewhere around the age that she is. Okay, her youthfulness, and this is important. Okay, because her youthfulness makes her easily manipulated. She's groomable and easily to be controlled. She's so young that she has not established a sense of herself yet. And so she is someone who's prime target to be um, pounced on and manipulated and formed into the way that the American wants her to be. And the term jig, jig, it's, it's not like, this is not like a common name like Sarah, or Emily, Amanda, Ashley, okay? Jig is an old term for a lively dance. And in the Elizabethan era, the word was also became slain for a practical joke or a trick, okay? And um, a 
yeah, this, you know, these this essentially this term jig, which might even just be a nickname that he, the the American has given her. All right, where he does not take her seriously. She is not there because uh, uh, right now where he's like, oh, you know, you're the love of my life. You know, you're my, you're gonna be my best friend. I love you. No, she is someone that he is using. He, uh, she is a is a lively dance. Okay, that's a euphemism for sex. All right, he is using her for sex. He doesn't really care about her feelings or her, her emotions. He is controlling her. Okay, he does not respect her. She's a jig. She's not a, anything respectable. She's a joke to him. Okay, for a good time. But now though, she's pregnant, and he needs to take care of that. Okay. But she also represents like just women in society, women who are, you know, becoming independent and they're going off. And uh, the the American, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, represents this sort of male-dominated society who wants to then put women in their place. They want to before women even have a chance really to become these these uh, independent, self-sufficient beings. Society wants to quickly put them in their place. Okay, more on that. The absence of alcohol. This is symbolic of the disappointment of adulthood. She says all those things you waited so long for, and then she expresses how they're a disappointment. And this is this idea of adulthood: you know, sex, alcohol, relationships. These things that, like, as kids, seem like they are so great, and like, oh wow, I can't wait. And so then, when she gets to, to that, you know, an hour into being an adult, and she's involved in sex and drinking, and this relationship with this older man, it is not anything that she had anticipated it was going to be. It seems so good, but it all just tastes like licorice. And some people, people might like licorice, but you can tell by her tone, she doesn't care for licorice. And everything just tastes like this. It's just, it seems like it was going to be so great. Like, I remember when I was a kid, I thought beer. Oh, my God, beer. My uh, my uncle made beer seem like it tasted so good. It was like, oh, my God, this must be the greatest drink. I mean, why else would you drink 12 in a row if it wasn't good? I can't wait to try this. And then uh, uh, when I was not old enough, but, you know, older, and I tried a beer, I was like, this is disgusting. Like, who drinks a case of these? This is what? You know, it was like not good. I thought it was going to taste like, have you ever been to um, Harry Potter World and you had the butter beer? I thought real beer at the time was going to taste something like butter beer, even though butter beer was, I was way before Harry Potter. But like, as an adult, when I tasted butter beer, I was like, this is what I probably imagined beer was going to taste like. Because I would have 12 of these right now in a row. Um, these butter beers, but but she's like you know disappointed. Things she waited for have turned out bad for her. Sex turns out it's not pleasing her, and it got her got her knocked up. Alcohol, all these drinks taste the same. They're not that good, okay. And the alcohol led her to having sex. Now she's in this relationship with this guy who really doesn't care about her at all. He he is not Prince Charming. He is not, um, you know, her bestie. He is just using her. And it's disappointing, okay? Which is why absinthe, you know, creates hallucinations. Creates who, uh, hallucination, okay? And so it's like, it makes you, you know, think that, like, some, something's going to be really great and cool. And you're under, you're under this fog of this idea, this trance, like, this is going to be so great. And the reality of is does not pan out. All right, the pregnancy. Pregnancy itself. Yeah, we can save the baby. Save the real kid. But also, though, the fetus in Jig, what it really represents is her adult womanhood that she's about to give birth to. Okay? Um, you know, this idea that, like, um, they all have their, you know, everyone has their soul inside them. And, and, but then, like, as you mature and you age and 
you have this new adult self. And so she is is pregnant with her soon to be independent adult self, away from her family on her own. And so it's like the American wants to get there real fast, real fast, in order to try to get her to abort her sense of independence and self sufficiency. It will make her easier to control and to manipulate. The abortion is the act of oh I put jog of jig, the young woman giving up young women giving up their independence and self preservation. To become subservient to men. Um, the patriarchy wants women to abort their inner independence, their self preservation, um, their their self esteem, and they in order to, so that way that they will become subservient to the male dominant society or the male dominated family household or the male dominated church or the male dominated uh, uh, businesses or to the male dominated Congress uh, and our political system. Okay, so the pregnancy is the potential for autonomy and independence in the young woman's life, and the abortion represents when women give those things up in order to become to be you know more 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 pleasable to men, to become to not be seen as a difficult woman or a bitch or a you know angry black woman to not become those things and so then they abort their own needs and their own goals and their own desires and those kind of things in order to in, in order to um, fit in with, with the patriarchy okay yeah the killing of their own autonomous identity it's like the title this brings us to the title of the story hills like white elephants the hills that they keep looking at represent the profile shot of a pregnant woman lying on her back. We have these hills that she's looking at, okay? And so it's supposed to be like the hills of a woman's body. Her head, her breasts, her stomach, and her knees. And so Jig is looking at that. And she's looking at herself, essentially, in the mirror and saying, do I, do I go forward and, and essentially give birth to myself? Now, this would mean that, like, if I do this, clearly, this guy is not going to stick around. He's not going to stay around. And so I will be alone, but I'll be free of him. Or do I succumb to his pressure? He stays with me, and I and I kill my inner spirit. This is a great story that we didn't have time to read because this class is only eight weeks. It's called um, The Adulterous Woman by Albert Camus. And it's about this woman. And um, she is in a relationship with her husband, and it's essentially codependent, okay? It's called The Adulterous Woman. She never has an affair in the story. But she does, though, uh, portray herself. She gives away her... She was in college. college. She uh, was going to... Uh, she was majoring. She was going to have a career. She was, a, she was an athlete. And then... She decides to marry this man who was going to be a lawyer and she falls under his umbrella and, and just kind of gives up her own life and stays with him totally and fully. And so the, the adultery that she commits is on herself. She betrayed her own relationship with herself and gave up herself. And the whole story is about her having this sort of like, this sort of like epiphany slash breakdown of realizing that like she had given her life away to this man okay and that like it wasn't much of a life so um that's uh jig is in the same is at the same crossroad like literally crossroad it's, it's a train it's, it's a train station where she has to decide does she give birth to herself and her independence okay or does she abort herself and give herself to this man, to this American, okay? So these are the hills that she's confronting herself, okay? She's looking in the mirror. The American, he is the patriarchy. He is, he represents the male-dominated social uh, structure, 
okay? Male-dominated society, uh, household, uh, uh, career, sector, church, political, all of it. School system, okay? Um, he is older, he's a dominant male who wants to manipulate and control big and just women in general, okay? The critic Thompson Thompson says, the man identified only as an American is the villain of the piece. He's a selfish, insensitive, emotional bully, the eternal adolescent who refuses to put down roots or to shoulder the responsibilities which are rightfully his. His empty, barren lifestyle is summed up by the girl. That's all we do, isn't it? Look at things and try new drinks. Okay? And that's the life that he wants. And he does not care about her needs at all. He wants to control Jig for his own use and pleasure. And he does not want to owe her anything. Okay? The patriarchy. Like the abortion. Again, the act of young uh, dog, Jig, um, slash young women, giving up their independence and self-preservation to become subservient to men. That's what he wants. He wants her to kill her inner self. So that way, um, he has her in the palm of his hand. The killing of her autonomous identity. Okay, he does this. He tries to achieve this through gaslighting. Okay, gaslighting. The use of manipulation. Gaslighting. Um, it is deceitful, duplicit manipulation where you make people doubt themselves, and uh, it helps you to. It helps. Uh, to achieve this through like breaking down their their, their sense of uh, independence, their their decision making abilities, their self esteem, all of this. So this is a series of of, of lines from, from the story. Uh, the italics are jig, the non italics are the American. Oh, we'll be fine afterward, just like we were before. We'll be fine after the abortion, just like we were before. What makes you think so? It's the only thing that bothers us. It's the only thing that made that made us unhappy. And you think then we'll be all right and be happy? I know we will. You don't have to be afraid. I've known lots of people who have done it. Well, the man said, "If you don't want to, if you don't want to, don't. You don't have to. I wouldn't have you do it if you didn't want to. But I know it's perfectly simple. I think it's the best thing to do. But I mean, I don't want you to do it if you don't really want to." And if I do it, you'll be happy and things will be like they were and you'll love me. That should be a sound side, sorry. I love you now. You know I love you. No, but if I do it, they know it'll be nice again. If I say things are like white elephants and you'll like it. I'll love it. I mean, I love it now, but I, I just can't think about it. You know how I get when I worry. And I, and I won't worry about that because it's, it's perfectly simple. Okay, so these are, these, these are lines from the story. Okay, let's look at his, uh, his his technique, his tactics of gaslighting her. First, first form form of manipulation: avoidance of blame by making it seem like it is her idea or her decision. Okay, if you don't want to, you don't have to. I mean, I wouldn't have you do it if you didn't want to, but I don't want you to do it if you don't really want to. I am saying this out loud. This allows him to not hold any type of responsibility. Later on, if she does, if she does have the abortion and she regrets it, she can't say, but you made me do it, made me do it. Because he can always say to her, no, I told you, you didn't have to do it unless you wanted to. It was your decision, it was not mine, it was yours, okay? Now this avoidance, this type of usage is always paired up, okay? With a continuing, a continual pressuring through repetition. You don't have to be afraid. But I know it's perfectly simple. I think it's the best thing to do. It's perfectly simple. He's pairing these two things up. He's pressuring her, but saying, oh, well, if you want to, even though I think you should. But you know, only if you think it's also the best, even though it is the best. Only if you're comfortable with it, but I'm telling you, it's totally simple. So he is controlling her all the way through this. He is set. He is creating uh, lines where where he can he can deny that he pushed her into it. 
by saying, by, you know, quoting himself. He did, in fact, he did, in fact, say, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. But he then also followed up and layered it with, it's totally fine. It's totally simple. I think it's the best thing you should do. You don't have to be afraid. It's cool. All right. Third, withholding affection of positivity. He has uh, created his, he has created a currency out of his 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 mood and his affection. And so then when he pulls that away from her, it is more motivating for her to go through with this in order to receive what he has taken away from her. We'll be fine afterward, just like we were before. Clearly right now we're not fine, and he's making sure she understands we're not good. But we will be good once you do it. That's the only thing that bothers us. It's the only thing that's made us unhappy. Again, I'm un unhappy now because of this. So if you do this, I will be happy. Cause and effect. And she says, do you think then we'll be right and be happy? And he says, I know we will. Right now we're not happy. But if you do this, then we will be happy. Cause and effect. He's withholding happiness and affection from her. Okay? And she says, if I do this, you'll like it. And if I do this and then I'll say things, you'll like it. And he says, I will love it. I will love it. I don't love it right now because you're, you're pregnant or you have your own sense of uh, empowerment or entitlement um, or you, you think that you that you are that you have your own autonomy. I don't like that. But if you do this, then I will like it. If you get rid of all that, you get rid of your sense of independence, you get rid of your autonomy, okay? You get rid of your own need to make a decision and you just are here to please me, okay? You abort and kill your inner soul. Then I will love it and I'll be good to you again, okay? Classic manipulation. Things were good in the beginning. Then the manipulator purposely pulls back and holds hostage the goodness and forces the person to make a decision. If you want this back, you want my good times back, then you need to do this action. Now look, men are not the only ones who manipulate. There are plenty of women also. People manipulate in general. I'm, I'm just, we're just talking about the, the patriarchy versus women's uh, independence in this one situation, okay? But there are plenty of women though who will will uh, latch onto a man and and make him really enjoy his time with her, okay? With, with her, her attitude and her funness and her sex and all that. And then she will say things like, she'll pull that back and say, all your friends need to go. I don't I don't like any of your friends. So your friends are all, hmm. and, your, and your mom, no, she is overly involved, okay? She needs to, you know, stop calling you so much in your family. And the guy then starts to starve for what he was getting before. Okay, her affection and her love and her her joy, her, her fun personality and her sex and all those things. So he's like, uh, oh, okay. And then he, he stops hanging out with his friends. He stops hanging out with his family. And then once she has him all to herself, then she'll start feeding him again all these things that he enjoyed in order to keep him, you know? So like, you know, men do this women do this, these are just forms of manipulation, okay? But in this story right here, we're talking about how how the American who represents the patriarchy uses these forms of manipulation on jig and women. And finally, he victimizes himself to ignite guilt in the person he's trying to manipulate. Because, you know, I just can't think about it. You know how I get when I worry oh my god, you know, this situation is just worrying me so much. And so she's like, oh, this poor baby, he's, he's suffering because of me. So if I have this abortion, I kill my inner soul, then he'll stop worrying so much. Yay! Okay. So no. Forms of manipulation. Um, so she's, you know, hearing this, and she's, 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 She's wavering. She's like, okay, I don't know. So then she tests the American. She confronts him by saying directly how he's wanting her to feel. She's trying to pull off his mask and reveal what he's doing. This directness startles him. 
and you backpedal. Just, okay, when I'll do it, okay, I'll do it. So she says, I'll do it because you don't care about me. He says, what do you mean? Well, I don't care about me. Well, I care about you. Oh, yeah. But I don't care about you. And I'll do it. And then everything will be fine, right? So this throws him, okay? Because um, there are people who are like, they do things uh, passively, okay? And so you'll meet people, you know, who are who are uh, passively aggressive, passively aggressively racist, who make uh, these things called microaggression, and they will um, say these little comments that demonstrate that they are that they are racist or xenophobic. Um, this is this older. Uh, white dude was talking to him and he was like oh you he's like uh i used to uh i used to like to announce uh football game youth football games but you know i can't pronounce any of these new names anymore and stuff so i just stopped doing it and he wanted to say to him you know that that's like really like xenophobic and uh you uh it's a microaggression saying that like with such a negative tone directed to uh, names that are not that he was not familiar with growing up, you know these traditional American names, and so by having this like negative spin and tone about these names of these new t- of of, uh, of kids is showing that that he himself does not like the fact that there are people here now who do not have these traditional names like John and Arnold and Smith, okay? And so, um, when you, when you know, people are, but like if I would have said to them, I probably should have, hey dude, that's like xenophobic, okay? That is you saying that you do not like the fact that these kids have names that did not originate, or at least to you, you don't think they originated in America. And so, uh, if you call people out right away on these microaggressions, it usually tends to like stun them, um, and because they're disguising it on purpose, they're they're doing it in a way where it makes themselves feel like, oh, I'm not really racist, you know, because I'm talking about this thing. Uh, but at the at the root of that, it is. So for like him, right, when she calls him out, that yeah you are essentially just want me to like not care about myself so that's what I'll, I'll do and he's like whoa I don't know what I mean which again he's a manipulator okay if he said yes that's right I, I, I don't want you to care about yourself I do want you to hate yourself then to use a phrase a pun the jig is up it's known that, that and, and he presents himself and she can then walk away so he, he's like no 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 he's in denial of it then she has this breakthrough Okay. The girl stood up and walked to the end of the station. Across on the other side were, were fields of grain and trees along the banks of the Ebro. Far away beyond the river were mountains. The shadow of a cloud moved across the field of grain, and she saw the river through the trees. Okay. He says, we can have everything. I'm sorry, no. He says, oh, we can have everything. He says, no, we can't. We can have the whole world, baby. No, we can't. We can go anywhere. You know, if she has the abortion. No, we can't. It isn't ours anymore. It's ours. No, it isn't. And once they... This is more... She's saying this more to herself. Once they take it away, you never get it back. Once they take... Once they, the patriarchy, take it away, sense of independence, you never get that liberation back. And he's like, but they haven't taken it away. He says, we'll wait and see. Come on back in the shade, he said. You mustn't feel that way. He's trying to control her. Change the subject. Say, oh, you know, you know, it's the heat that's getting to you. Which is gaslighting. Making her doubt herself. She's, this is not an authentic feeling. It's the heat. And you should try to stop feeling this way. He's controlling her emotions. He says... 
I don't feel any way. I just know things. And he says, I don't want you to do anything that you don't want to do. And she says, oh no, sorry, I was just a little bit. Nor that isn't good for me. Hmm? Said, oh, I know. I know you care so much. Now let's talk about what's happening here, okay? The final line. Nor that isn't good for me, she said. I know. This is sarcasm, all right? She has the break. She realizes that he is totally con trying to control her, and he does not care about her own needs, okay? And she's almost more like talking to herself, okay? So we, this is, this, this is her uh, inner self, and maybe we as women, okay? We cannot, we cannot, okay? It isn't ours anymore. If I have this abortion, Okay, patriarchy wins. He wins. If I kill my inner self, the American wins. Okay, he tries to tell her you have to go that way, and she realizes that 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 like he does not really care about her feelings at all. Okay, and so she's identifying his false sincerity. No, that isn't good for me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I know, I know you care so much. And then she says, I just know things. This is her female intuition. This is the, female intuition is the kryptonite to men um, and their insincerity, which is why gaslighting is so effective, because gaslighting makes women doubt themselves. It makes them question their intuition. And it's just like in a, in a, um, in a trial. If the defense can just get the jury to question, to question uh, the prosecution, then they know that they'll get that they'll get a not gu guilty verdict because at least or a hang trial, okay? Because if they can get at least one person to question the the uh, the validity of the evidence, then they won't vote. They will they they won't vote guilty, right? And it won't be unanimous. And so, if uh, the um, if it's kind of that idea, of what, what, what was that term uh, that Kevin Conway said? Alternative facts. Alternative facts are meant to sow disconcern and to make people question what is real and what isn't real. Therefore, then they will be like, well, you know, I can't really necessarily believe that. And so gaslighting is a tactic used to attack a woman's intuition, her ability to know things without even having to see the facts, okay? And that's a sense of, that, that women have far greater than men, and it comes from nature and, and uh, uh, biology, where you have these mothers who have to figure out and understand what their nonverbal children are dealing with babies, infants, one year old, okay, what's going on within them that they cannot express. That's female intuition. And it's a strong sense. And so she knows that he is gaslighting her and doesn't actually care about her needs or feelings. Okay? Um, she knows it. And she's she's done. Okay, she tells him I just know things, and I know that you are full of bullshit, and I'm, I'm, I'm done with that, okay? The short description of the valley of the Ebro suggests something to jig. It is an image of life's possibilities. Boris Lanier remarks that critics generally agree that the brown, dry, and fertile land represents a rootless, empty, and sterile life, like the one the couple is presently living. While the fertile land along the Ebro River represents the meaningful and fruitful life Jig could have on her own, okay? And so she won't grow, she won't produce, she won't be, you know, healthy if, she's, if she is living this life uh, with, with the American. And the title of the story refers to, to white elephants, okay? And that's significant because, look, a white elephant, in one meaning of the term, is anything rare, expensive and difficult to keep. Any bird is in possession. 
an object no longer is seen by its owner, though not without value to others. This is basically how the man feels about caring for someone else's needs. Um, she is the white elephant for him. Okay, having a partner where you actually have to take time to consider their needs is difficult. It's difficult to have to continuously consider someone else's feelings. And so it's a burdensome, it's burdensome for some. All right, there are there are a lot of people who want to be in relationships because relationships relationships look good for politics and society. Uh, relationships uh, work well if you have someone who is just going to take, you know, do everything for you. Um, it, there, there, there's guilt-free sex in a relationship that you're committed and stuff. But there are a lot of people who, who they don't actually really want to have to work in a relationship at all. And so it is burdensome, okay, and not much of value. While for other people, it is really important, and they want to work hard, and they want to take care of it. What happens after the story ends? There's clearly tension between the couple. The story comes to an end. Jig is, Jig is no longer going to cater to his needs. And if he wants her to stay in his life, you will have to try to be more considerate of her needs and accept that she will make her own decisions. You know, like, um, this story, along with the story I told you about earlier about the adulterous woman, neither one of them end with an actual breakup. Okay, because I don't think that the solution has to be a breakup um, as much as just a... Uh, establishment of one's own independence. And so here at this story, this ending, we get a little bit of redemption from the American. He says, uh, at the very end, I better take the bags over to the other side of the station. So, he gets up to, like, prepare things, to, to start setting things up for when they get to the, uh, onto the train. And she smiles at him. He says, alright, then come back and we'll finish the beer. Then we'll do this. Okay? And he says, do you, do you feel better? goes, uh, well, I mean, I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Because she is not worrying about him and all that, 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 how he's doing. She's here for herself. He is serving her by taking the bags over and preparing what's going to happen next, okay? And she sits back and, and she's, she appreciates that. And then she tells him, we'll finish the beer. Okay, come back and we'll finish the beer. Here are the plans. And so they're, they're both working in unison here. He is doing this, and then she says, let's do this, and she's good with that. So as long as the man stops trying to gaslight her, control her, and, and be overly dominant, then she'll be fine, okay? She has, she has her boundaries. So that's the story, okay? the end. Um, I hope you got something out of that. I hope that helped you to understand it better. I hope you see how it fits into our unit, okay? And maybe a story that you liked enough that you will write about it for a paper one. Okay. All right, bye-bye.